Welcome to the second episode of Jonah and the Whale. Jonah will now go to Nineveh. Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the empire that is oppressing his people to bring them the good news. <laughs> now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God, all shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat, he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah, to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. But then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush from which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in the night and perished in the night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you pour forth your word for us. Open our souls, open our minds and our hearts, that we might hear that word this day. Amen. One of my heroes, Brian Norcross, <laughs> gave us really good news this week, a kind of once-in-a-lifetime summer event. There's nothing on the tropical weather map. It was blank. All's quiet on the tropical storm front. Not so in here this morning. There's a major advisory coming from the top. There are prevailing ill winds out of Nineveh, and Jetstream Jonah won't broadcast the news. There's a storm brewing. God commanded Jonah, 
get up and go. Go and tell the people of your powerful adversary, you've got to change your evil ways, baby. Jonah had his own plan. Run away! I'll go to Tarshish. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land will never track me down there. And so in this developing vortex between Jonah and the Lord, Jonah will do anything to avoid doing what God commanded. What's the big deal? Just walk into the capital city of the evil empire and tell them God's heard what you're getting up to. Maybe Jonah's thinking, if I don't give them God's impending doom, update, and advisory, maybe God will do what a righteous God is supposed to do and give them what they deserve. And so Jonah is nothing if not determined to lead the Ninevites to what he hoped will be their terrible fate. Cancel my bottom of the hour news advisory on the 9 o'clock Nineveh news, buy a ticket, hop on a cargo ship, preferably one that is not stuck in line at the port, and set sail in the opposite direction. Tracking the storm, we have upper level flows of steadfast love and headwinds coming from a petulant prophet. God sends a mighty storm. God is tracking Jonah. In that storm, steadfast work, steadfast love at work in gale force winds. Ship seems like it's about to break up. Frightened sailors start throwing the cargo overboard to lighten the load, and they're each one crying out to their own gods to save them. So the wind is blowing 40 knots, and down in the hold, down in the dark, Jonah's getting 40 winks. The pagan, idol-worshiping sailors are praying. The captain has to come down into the belly of the ship and wake Jonah up. Hey, Mr. Shorty Snore, snap to, get up and pray. Maybe, just maybe, your God will spare us. And so, in the middle of this storm on the sea, there's a tempest on the ship. And it's a storm within the sailors' hearts. What about Jetstream Jonah? The worshiper, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, who was fleeing that God over land and sea. His plan B is toss me into the sea. What if he just stuck to God's plan A? The sailors turn around and are rowing desperately back to shore. They risk their lives and their ship trying to beach their boat in the middle of a storm. Willingly, they've taken on a fugitive. Jonah told him what he was doing. They've taken on this fugitive from divine service. Now, reluctantly, they're going to surrender that fugitive to divine mercy. Jonah is cast into the sea. And the winds cease. The water's calm, the weather subsides, but God is still tracking a storm. That storm is called Jonah. He's a walking, talking hurricane, headwinds from his heart, headwinds of anger and fear and hubris and hard-heartedness. And God is in pursuit of that prodigal prophet relentlessly tracking him from the belly of the boat to the belly of the beast. Every place that Jonah tries to flee from his calling, every place that actually Jonah is trying to flee from himself. And so rescued from this surging sea and swallowed into the belly of the beast, in that belly of the beast, Jonah has his dark night of the soul. And there, in God's dazzling darkness, Jonah offers an agonized prayer. Out of my distress, I cried to the Lord, and God answered me. And that prayer is tossed to and fro and rising and falling with the swells of Jonah's spirit. He wants to die. 
to flee from God. But if he dies, he's grieving that he won't be able to be with God in the temple. He rebukes God. You put me in the sea. These are your waves. These are your billows crashing upon me. He makes promises to God. I will give thanks to you. We all do that, don't we? A promise he will never keep. How many of us do? Jonah never thanks God for his miraculous rescue in the fish or from the fish. God gives him a second chance. How many times do we do this in our life? Pick yourselves up, brush yourselves off, and start all over again. Go and deliver the message that I gave you. Jonah goes, but he packs up his anger in his old kit bag, and he does not smile, smile, smile. And he has that long walk to Nineveh to work out what he's going to say in this Cat 5 advisory for Nineveh. And reaching the heights of homiletical arts, he comes up with an eight-word sermon. It's better in Hebrew. It's only five. Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overturned. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> Hardly Toastmasters. There's not one word of hope. But guess what? The Ninevites don't know the Lord from Adam, but they repent with a kind of storm prep that stiff-necked Jonah could never have imagined. This is a bottom-up story. The people, even the animals, begin a fast before the declaration of a fast is made. Then, Despite widespread reports of supply chain issues in the sackcloth market, the people, the king, and the animals put on sackcloth and ashes. And you know what? They change their evil ways, baby. God forgives. Jonah is furious. Most of us are sure, we're sure, who deserves punishment and who deserves mercy? The king embraces something that Jonah is fighting. When it comes to God's mercy, who knows? No one can make God do anything. It's hard enough to try to make people do something. God is free to be merciful anytime, anywhere, to anyone or anything. The king of Nineveh threw himself and his people and all the creatures of Nineveh into the arms of that mercy. The people changed their ways. And that upper level high of God's mercy pulls the storm out to sea. Good news. Not so for Jonah. For Jetstream Jonah, it was an evil thing, a very evil thing. Because Jonah spends more time in stormy arguments with God than doing what God wants him to do. Jonah spews out anger and bitterness. Oh, Lord, I knew it. That is why I didn't want to do this in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, because that's what Pastor Moore always says. My forecast was right. You relented. When Jonah was floundering around inside that fish, he prayed to God to save his life. Now he wants God to let him die rather than see God show mercy to the people he thinks don't deserve it. And the irony seems lost on Jonah that he survived his disobedience, he survived his flight, he survived the storm, he survived the fish because of God's grace, mercy, patience, and steadfast love to him. So God asks, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah ignores the question. When's the last time God asked you a question and you thought you'd ignore it? Mercy for Nineveh means mercy for the Assyrians, which means that that empire will live to fight another day, and fight they will. Mercy for Nineveh is a cat five forecast for Jonah's people. 
And so Jonah stomped out of Nineveh, found a place with a view, made himself a little hut, plopped himself down, and waited for the feeder bands to start rolling into Nineveh. Hoping for the feeder bands to roll into Nineveh. There he sits, brooding in his hut in the heat. God sends a plant to give him shade, a gracious gift. Then God gave Jonah a taste of the medicine Jonah wanted to prescribe for Nineveh. Perhaps the withering weed and the worm would yield some wisdom to our willful one. Perhaps some hot air will help this hothead learn some compassion. God asked Jonah another question. After the vine wilts, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? What did you do to make it? It was a gift. You had it for one day. Apparently, Jetstream Jonah doesn't think he owes God an explanation. This is how he answers. Yes, angry enough to die. Thankfully, God offers us a persistent forecast of patience. So you care about the bush, the thing you did nothing to deserve, the thing I gave you, the thing you had for one day. And God asked Jonah the final Jeopardy question. You are angry about a plant. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh? A great city, 120,000 people. They don't know their right hand from their left. And this is my favorite part. And all those animals. This is where you expect Jonah to fall on his knees and cry out, what was I thinking? Of course you should be merciful. Of course I should strive to be merciful. One of the midrash, the commentary, the rabbinic commentaries on Jonah, says that actually Jonah did answer that question. And it didn't make it into the final version of our story because it was unfit to print. Instead, we're kind of left with Joseph's harumph and God's big question floating out there. And there the story stops. But it doesn't end. It leaves us the cone of uncertainty. How do we answer God's question? In some ways, Nineveh's kind, of, Nineveh's kind of a storm in a teacup. Jonah, if you listen, never says a word about Nineveh. This is less about Nineveh's wicked ways and more to do with God's sovereign freedom to be gracious. How mad that makes us. This vortex is between Jonah and God. Jonah wants justice. And God pours out grace upon everyone and their cows. The root of Jonah's turmoil is that grace is needed most by those who deserve it least. The root of our turmoil is that that mercy is as troubling for us as it was for Jonah. And thankfully, I'll never tire of saying this to you. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. And the Hebrew there is beautiful. It means long in breath, long suffering, and abounding in steadfast love. Mercy and graciousness are part of who God is. We have to work at them. And that's why I love Jonah. Jonah lives where we live. Struggling with God, struggling with ourselves, struggling with each other in a tempestuous world with more questions than answers. And God challenges us to change our evil ways, baby. And some of us would rather jump in the ocean than do that. We make decisions every day, all too often with poor visibility and not knowing our right hand from our left. 
And even if we want to be merciful, it's not always clear how to be merciful with animals or people. We make our way in this vortex of God's relentless mercy, often unsure of our own. And we're so easily thrown off course by the storms in our own souls. If we learn anything from Jonah, I would say this, lift up your hearts. God, our steadfast storm tracker, rains grace upon us, chases us with mercy, and encourages us with winds of patience just when we need it. And so let us ask, may God still us with peace. Amen.